All right, let's talk this through by speaking with a public health consultant, Tuyi Mebawadu. We also have a medical consultant and chief medical director, Heritage Men's Clinic, Dr. Rashid Abbasi. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on uh, the program this morning. Good morning. My pleasure to be here. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. Thank you for Dr. having me. Yeah, so um, we, we've always heard about um, joys of motherhood, and it's so sad to see, uh, to witness the cry of motherhood. Help us understand, let me start with you, Dr. Mibaldu. Um, help us understand what happened or what you think might have happened as a result of the missing intestine. Because I felt if that part is missing in the body, it's not, it may not be possible for one to still stay alive. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I will say two things clearly. One, the health system or the healthcare system or the medical doctors must now understand that clearly. You cannot, be, you cannot confine medical practice to, your, to the forewall of your consulting clinics. In the era of tweets, clicks, media, social media, likes, and thumbs up, healthcare has actually metamorphosed and moved into the public space. It's used now to trend and drive traffic. Please note that. Those days, so we have moved to health system 3.0, where you have to engage the media where you have to engage people that are involved in health, both the consumer of health and or people that are monitoring health. Very clear, okay? You will get to my flow. Secondly, the second thing is that media itself, okay, should understand that health reporting is not just like every other reporting. Health has its own complication, and I'm challenging media houses to do a lot of deep training for people that are actually doing their health. Uh, reporting, so that, I, again, we can get a clearer understanding. Now, let's look at this boy. It's so sad that a young boy of 13 years will have to go through this kind of experience, okay? And the good aspect of it is that um, the governor of Lagos is that came in and said, listen, I'm going to take charge of this. I want to also challenge him that we shouldn't leave it to this boy. There are a lot of people that are critically ill and cannot afford some expensive thing. Let us figure how to bridge the gap for them. Now, the, what we know in the public space is that this, this, the young boy, uh, Debola Bright, was in a, an hospital for a procedure. Okay? He underwent the procedure. After some months, came back with some issues. Had to actually, they had to actually go in again, try to correct those mistakes. And in the process, a lot of things happened. I said, okay, wait, we cannot treat this boy. We're now going to refer you to um, last suit. Now, on getting to last suit, probably there was um, interaction between the, patient, the parents and the doctors. And they said that, listen, for whatever reason, this part of intestine had some problem. Let me tell you, what we call short bowel syndrome is a common, it can occur in some conditions. If you have inflammatory you know, bowel disease, if you have uh, what you call um, colitis, a kind of, you know, uh, enterocolitis, whereby infection sets in, complication sets in, there is viral obstruction, you know, you can lose part of the intestine. They can, the, the blood supply to the intestine can be compromised. Once the blood supply to the part of the intestine is compromised, you have no choice than to resect it. The same means that you have to remove it. It will be, use, it will be useful. A gangrene can occur along the line of intestine based on a lot of condition. And you see that this boy can fit into that um, uh, narrative. But what has happened is that, you know, because we know, I had, you know, in my public work in Lagos State, I spent how many years in Massey? Ten years working in Massey State Children's Hospital. And I understood clearly complications that can come from a lot of things, from some of the things we neglect, okay? Now, I don't want, until the, I don't want to actually preempt what, have, what the outcome of the investigation may be like. But what I know exactly is this. If you're a medical doctor, now, please listen, doctors, or or, or, or healthcare provider. If you're a medical doctor, as your client is coming in, set up an interactive face. This is what we'll see. This is the likely outcome. You know, do you know this? Do you know that? And record it. Okay? Now, as you progress, also discuss the progress of the patient. Where you have, say, where you take any tissue from the body, either the placenta, either the intestine, whatever, either the foreskin of the baby, hand over to the Caregiver, how about to the parents? Don't, don't say that they will go and throw it away. Listen, this is what we took away from your distance. Yeah. Eh? Hand it over. 
So it becomes very clear to them. I'm sure those kind of things might have happened in the course of this thing. Tell you what, the whole intestine is about, um, you know, 600 cm or so. You know, some can be a bit more. When you lose half of it, either as a result of infection, either as a result of enterocolitis or, or compromise of blood supply to part of that part of the intestine, from obstruction, from, you know, volvulus, any of those things, they have to resect it. It is the practice anywhere. The reset means to, 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 to remove, remove, to cut it and discard. Cut it in the middle and you cut it. that aspect of the, and join it back. When you have to reset, when you reset more than fifty percent, the person has no choice to undergo what you call total parietal nutrition. What else? How do you do and get absorption? Okay, we'll, we'll no, get to no, we'll no. no I've I, I, okay. I, I just run up right. in that regards now. So now, what has what has happened is that it's sensationalization of this reportage. Tell you what I experienced, you know, in my in my journey abroad and interacting with medical people is that as you are coming in, there's a what they call, you know, a counseling room. You enter, the doctor enters, or your relative enters, the doctor's enter. You have discussion, you ask questions. That this is done every other day until the patient is discharged. Every other day, we have to actually imbibe that. Interesting. Uh, well. Uh... It's quite, it's quite interesting, uh, Dr. Abasi. Um, yes. You know, from the story, we found out that the boy was treated, you know, for, uh, for typhoid uh, earlier this year. Could, could poor treatment of, you know, typhoid have resulted into a ruptured appendicitis, you know, that it was later diagnosed for, according to what the mother said? Yeah, it's, it's actually a very, very sad case. I don't think this is a case of organ harvesting. I think it's a case of incompetency and poor medical infrastructure. And now it's, it's now gone beyond the mistake because there is a lot of cover-up. So if you look at the genesis of the boy's unfortunate case, uh, let's give credit where it is due. So the governor has set in as a responsible human being, not even as a politician. He set in because he's a father. So he's doing what is the right thing. But he does not need to get to this stage. Let's take a step back. So this unfortunate boy was taken to a private hospital for what is called, quote, unquote, ruptured appendix. We all know that one of the complications of ruptured appendix will lead to a small bowel obstruction because only God knows how long that has been going on. So it was operated, and a few days later, he needed to revisit the hospital again where complications occurred. So now, talking about what, what my colleague has said earlier, it's totally on point because it could have been as a result of ischemic bowel, it could have been an infection, it could have been necrotizing, fascia. All these will lead to the loss of that small intestine. The small intestine cannot be transplanted in Nigeria, not even in Africa. So it's not about being harvested. Mm -hmm. But in order to prevent this kind of situation from occurring again, we need to take a step back and look at the kind of healthcare situation we have in Nigeria. Who licensed the first hospital where they went to? We have hospitals in Nigeria, in Lagos, where you get there, they don't have x-ray machine. They don't even have oxygen. It's not only the case of Debola, unfortunately. We had another one in the social media of a nothing woman who delivered a baby that had jaundice, and the hospital had no phototherapy. Jaundice, as we all know, once it gets into the brain, it causes irreversible brain damage, canicterous. Now the boy is blind. The governor cannot be going in and stepping in every time. So we need a board. We need accountability. The medical community should be the one championing this because there are so many places where they've dropped the ball. The incompetence is one. That's medical malpractice. And this has been going on. I mean, we Are can you saying this incompetency is coming from the earlier um, place where the mother must have taken the child? Or could it, be, could it have been Lassus? Absolutely, they all now. Well, because, because, because they've been back and forth. Lassus said, you know, claiming, not claiming responsibility. The other is also pushing, you know, just blame game, you know, between the two, the two medical facilities. facilities. Yeah, so there is a big cover-up. There is a big lack of transparency. Because on arrival to Lassut, once if Lassut had done the needful, which is what we do abroad, you come in before pre-op, you do all your investigative studies, they would have done what my colleague advocated. Have the family members, give them the information that, look, Debola is here, we don't know where he's been, this is the situation we have. So there would not be cover-up, or there would not even be the perception and then, who was the surgeon that attended to him at last suit? Why is the surgeon not stepping out? Why does it have to take the crying mother to call the attention of the governor? But again, we're just dealing with the symptoms. Let's look at the old health care, the lack of infrastructure, the training of our medical doctors. Have we had any curriculum change in so many decades? No. And so, we're sending our doctors out there. It's like we're sending them to the battlefield and we're not giving them all the tools they need. Mm, but there, there's got to be transparency and accountability. Yeah, you said that um, the intestine cannot be harvested. Uh, and I feel that um, you might be misunderstood because 
uh, in the era where we have um, people who are afraid of, okay, people who are harvesting organs, they're trafficking organs, they're trafficking people to harvest their organs, that maybe this could have been the case. Could you try to expatiate on what you're trying to say? Excellent point. So I, I am strongly convinced this is a case of medical incompetence and not organ harvesting. It's not the case of, oh, they need to steal my son's kidney or my son's intestine for it to be sold on the black market. No. If you look at the genesis of this, this is a 13-year-old boy that was taken to a private hospital, quote, unquote, having abdomen, what we consider abroad as an acute abdomen. It turns out to be diagnosed with a ruptured appendix. One of the complications when a little boy, any boy, appears or presents to your facility with a ruptured appendix is you have to do the needful and make sure you exclude complications like small bowel obstruction. When small bowel obstruction sets in and is not timely addressed, it's going to lead to what is called ischemic bowel. There will be no more blood flow. When that bowel is dead, it's no longer harvestable. It's not something you can transplant. So that's why I believe strongly that it was some medical doctors that were incompetent in the field of medical practice, and now it's covered up. If it's either from the private sector, now coming to lawsuit. Who was the first surgeon that attended to it? Let me give you a scenario. So I'm in Washington, D.C. You bring a 12, 13-year-old boy to me, if I'm the surgeon in this case. There has to be preoperative clearance. There will be a cardiologist that will clear that this boy needs this. He will be able to survive my surgery. A pulmonologist will be there. EKGs will be done. Lab work will be done. CT scan will be done. All these are things that the infrastructure provides. And that allows me to know that, oh, wow, is this going to be a two-hour surgery, four-hour surgery? Do I need backup? Do I need to call other consultants because of possible complications? Doctors are human beings. They're not angels. We know, so we should be able to accommodate for that. But in this case, none of this was absolutely done. Right, uh, Dr. Mebaudu. Uh, well, Madam Deborah, that's um, the Akin's, uh, Akin's mother, claimed that Lasso showed her you know, only a part uh, and not a complete video of the surgery they carried out on the, on the ball. Are there hospital laws that forbid you know, making public a full surgical operation? Well, um, what happened is that let us appreciate uh, the fiduciary nature okay, of healthcare delivery. Most of the time, even if you and your wife come, come to me for care, um, for me to disclose your issue to her, I must take your permission. We, you don't just throw out people's information like that. That is one of the rules that guide medical care. Of course, but it doesn't mean that you cannot do a proper documentation. And that's why, in essence, the most important thing in health is actually documentation. You have to put everything down here and there. But we, we, we look at the health system because, listen, I had been in public practice with Lagos State Government for more than 21 years. But yes, you know, in the past. I can understand some of these things that is that, happening. Um, I remember there are a lot of issues in our healthcare system. You know, there are outside the hospital issues, inside the hospital issues, and post care issues. Even pre care issues is such that you see people coming to the hospital even late, you know, for their care because of their limited understanding of what their health issues are. You mean reporting the case yes, hospital? Yes, yes, even, even, even for, because again, you ask yourself, how do you get to a ruptured appendix? You know, I, I don't want to even it mention. Must have been to yes, them. okay, so okay. It, it might be just the ignorance of the mother, okay? After having said that, okay, that we also need to do a proper documentation and care, you know, at the level of having to do the surgery. We know what are the likely outcomes, and we must explain that to the parents in clear terms, very clear terms, and document. Do you want me to go on or do you don't want me to go on? Okay, and then the, the third thing is that I, I want to allow the different um, committee or different groups set up to look at this to do their work. I'm not going to prejudice any of those things. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that it's not the Lagos State House of Health that you be doing this. It's not Lagos. You see, we have the in the medical system we have the schemes of checking on things up to the Nigeria Medical and Dental Council. That is where we are now. What is Lagos State Assembly's business about that? What do you understand about the details of medical care? Even if I have to sit down and start, you know, explaining necrotizing enterocolitis, why, why would they get to understand the previous complications? Yeah, do not forget so, that some so, of the politicians so, are also... No, forget it. I'm telling you. you know, the, the medical, when you set up, when you look at it from the level, level of medical and dental counsel, everybody necessary to understand the depth of care and the, and the protocol of care. They are there. Have you done this? Have you done this? Have you done that? Okay? So, but... What this one is pointed to, like I said, is, listen, doctors, hospitals, don't, don't, don't run away from the media and social media you know, engagement. 
in your doings. Don't think that, I mean, they, what, not, you can say anything is not going so to matter. So you mean they, they would have owned the narrative? They would have probably... But you, 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 have to be, you, you have to be careful how much of it you, you, how much, much of it you have to really give out. But documentation becomes, again, a key important thing. And then patient engagement. Let me give you an example. Um, you know, we used to see a lot of people in Massachusetts Children's Hospital those days. These people will have advanced TB, small children, advanced tuberculosis. We, I look at it and say, what is happening? Um, this, is a fam this is a society that loves children so much. Why are we having advanced cases? But what, you know what happened? Until I went to Uppsala University you know, uh, in, in Sweden, I, I, I did a study, the caretaking behavior of this mother. Uh, there are delay stations. First and foremost, there's a poor structure in the family. It might be the grandmother who will say that, listen, in our family, when you cough, this is what we give. And the woman cannot do anything beyond that power structure. That will cause a reasonable delay. Then there are other people who run around the family and say, ah, eh, yalagbo, yadis at the corner. Those ones will also give their own treatment. More delay. By the time it gets to the hospital, we're seeing an advanced case. By the time you get to the hospital now, test, card, everything, another lengthy delay. So in reality, if you want to touch health, you have to look at that spectrum. Because in reality, you cannot do much if you don't touch down those level of interventions and what to do. But I want to caution doctors. We are entering an era of litigation and all those things. Guys, document properly. Document properly. Interact with patients and let them know. Let them sign the necessary papers. Because at the end of the day, you, you get the rap. You get the negative imaging. I, I saw a, a radio station devoted two hours of their airtime discussing this thing. And I wonder that what is going on here? Where they're going to throw us under the bus if you're not careful. So please, you know, as much as possible, do all you can right. uh -huh, within your power to right. ensure that, you know, you document and, and, and save life. Right, Dr. Rashid, <clears throat> so. you know, when people do not understand something, they tend to, you know, blow it out of proportion based on sentiments, based on experiences and all of that. And you can't blame people, you know, for their reaction because this is all about life, which yes. is, has, has got no duplicate. Uh, so do you feel that, because look at this boy in the center of this whole story. He's so frail now. He's in very bad condition. And you try to make us understand, make us understand that um, this is not a case, to, a case of organ harvesting, yes. as far as you know. Yes. Right. But what exactly do you think this boy, what can be done for this boy? Because if it's supposed to be a treatment, a procedure to bring him back alive, then he shouldn't still be bedridden. Absolutely. And we need to, like, besides, I don't want to be just going back and giving credit to the governor for stepping in because the boy's case could be worse. It could have gotten worse, like so many thousands and millions that just end up die. So his own case now, where it is, can be arrested to some extent. The mother had alluded in one of the videos that we saw on the social media that it will cost her an average of about 69 to 70,000 naira to feed the boy on TPN because he does not have any small intestine anymore. So if there is no small intestine, is that the way the, the boy is going to live forever? Unfortunately, yes, because now he's not going to be able to eat the kind of food you and I will eat. The way your GI system works, which starts from your mouth all the way to the back end, you need a part of your intestine that processes and leads to absorption. He doesn't have that. So all he has left now is the colon. That's their body. So they have to be giving him TPN, which is already processed, semi-digested food, and it can only be taken into his vein. So he has a long road ahead. If the governor is actually committed to what he said, his care will need to be transferred abroad. Trust me. So would there, would there, need, would there be need for a transplant? of that intestine, that is, the, the small intestine that is missing? So can it be transplanted? So depending on what the situation is now, they will need a GI surgeon to come on board and see. Because when you're talking about transplant, that's another bag of worms. It has to be committed to long-term anti-rejecting medications, if he's actually a candidate for that. But we do have patients like that in the US that lives a normal life, but they just have to be on TPN. But again, let's step back. It's only, we are talking about Debola now. There are thousands of people like this. It does not have to be in the case of a surgery that went bad or incompetent doctors. We're talking about taking people to Lasso, to Luth, with uncontrolled hypertension, and doctors treating them and you know, just normalizing the blood pressure without following protocol. No, we do not need the Lagos State government or the Lagos State Assembly to be intervening now. We need boards. Everywhere there is medical delivery system, there will be checks and balances. Doctors, again, are not angels, so we know they're going to be prone. But don't let's put them in a situation where this happens every day and day. If I take it personal, this is the case where I lost my mom in 2008. They took her there with uncontrolled hypertension, and a doctor was telling me on the phone that, oh, don't worry, mama's blood pressure is now normal. 
I said, wow, that's the last for my mom. And she died. The doctor said, well, did any governor step up? No. So in order for us to prevent this from happening again, we need to address our healthcare delivery system. We need medical intelligence. That's how we know the data. How many of these doctors are doing this? What kind of infrastructure do we have? We're licensing hospitals that should not even be hospitals. Some of these places, a lady in the north gave birth to a baby with jaundice. Jaundice is expected with delivery at times. You should have phototherapy. And so called hospital has no phototherapy and the baby became blind. The governor is not going to step in. The state assembly does not have any business with that. We need the board. We need the medical and dental association to step in. It shows that there's a, there's a whole lot of, um, yeah. whole lot of issues. I, right? I, let, let me just uh, you know, put this in. In the whole the spectrum of healthcare system, hmm? there's what we call inputs, there's process, there's output, there's outcome. Okay? Most of the inputs are actually from government. Okay? You don't actually, the hospital is not building. Let's get it straight. Also, it's mainly equipment and human resources, you know, competent human resources, you know, and proper clinical compliance system, okay, clinical governance system. Okay, now, if you set up an hospital and you're not putting for the therapy, you put doctors there, you put the therapy machine, you put the doctors there, what do you want them to do in essence? You're not putting any BT facilities there. Even if they want to use blood, there's no blood. What do you want them to do in reality? If before, before we can start, you know, demanding the right bank for the box, we must be able to put the right money there. We must be able to put the right investment there. Healthcare is fun, it's money. You know, because those equipment, now what are we talking about? We are talking about application of artificial intelligence into the healthcare system. They're not cheap. Because human life is not cheap. So until we figure it out and say that, listen, um, how do we fund the health system? How do we put the right thing there? How do we start setting standard like his hospital in where he's talking in, in, in Washington DC mm -hmm. or, or, or anywhere? We cannot just start demanding, you know, what we don't. So government needs to do that. After that is done, of course, I know that you also must put on a proper protocol of care. You, you know, you will not easily get to hospital abroad and somebody will start looking at you and start giving you IV straight. No. They have to do a lot of checking. It will appear like delay to you. That's why you cannot easily, easily get a brother and say, yeah, I'm going to buy it about uh, but, nobody but, will give sorry, you. Sorry, Dr. Mibaldo. I, I want to puncture some of, the, you know, some of the claims that you know, when you get abroad, we tend to see the abroad, so to speak, quote unquote, as the, the apogee of you know, administering quality health care. Maybe they are just there. My younger sister will give birth you know, earlier this year, complained about the fact that the, she was neglected in the UK. She was neglected, and thank God for the fact that her mother, uh, the, the, the husband's mother was there, who is also a medical, uh, med, 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 medical provider. Um, she was the one backing at the nurse. You need to move closer to her. You need to touch her. She's, she's losing uh, strength. She's, uh, and then the woman, the, 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 the white doctor, could not do the right thing, which ordinarily wouldn't have happened in Nigeria. So, so how about that kind of, not yeah. true to move away from the issue. Yes. The point I'm making is that it is not always rosy. You, you, because again, you know what, um, if you look at, if you gauge a care, uh, quality of care, you understand, and you, look, and you put 100 people, you know, and try to see, you know, to care, what is the outcome of those 100? What, are, what you're going to get there is that the majority of them uh, will actually get very good response. There are a lot of um, high-tech, you know, uh, touch equipment has it's been updated, training has been updated, check has been updated. That's why we're saying. So what we're saying now is that uh, if you want to replicate that here, you must, that input is essential. You cannot, you know, put, put a building and put scanty material there and ask the doctor to go and do miracle. Then go to church now. Just go to church. There are a lot of them that are doing miracle with, with this. Thing. Some basic yes. needs must be, must be met. It, it's not even basic. Right. The, the, the equipment must meet to the standard you are expecting, both in human resources, both in equipment, both in, you know, before you start setting standards right. of what should happen in the hospital. Right. You, 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 you. No, like, like the case of your sister now. So that, those are the kind of situations we're trying to reduce abroad. Again, I said doctors are not angels, but we need to have all these checks and balances in place. So that is one off, and trust me, if they follow the normal protocol, the nurse in charge of your sister will need to account. That has to be accountability. In Nigeria, we don't have that. Our healthcare delivery system is non-existent. 
let's call a spade a spade. If not, there will be more unfortunate cases of Debola. So in order for us to try and arrest that now, we need to go back. I, I said this earlier to the new administration, our healthcare system is so bad that they actually have an opportunity to lay a good foundation moving forward. Because this should not be the case of the state assembly. We're talking about how do we license hospitals in Lagos? You're talking about five-story building, and they say they have OB gang clinic. How, there is no elevator. There is no power. How do you expect a pregnant woman to get there? And there may be no, no ramp. Or no whatever. ramp, yes. Who gave them the license for that? Uh, trust me, I applaud Governor Sawolu stepping in because he's acting not as a politician, as a responsible, caring man. But we need to step back and say, how can we prevent this from happening again? Because there are unfortunate cases not only of the bullet that goes on now as we speak. Okay, so uh, let me come to you. But, uh, let me come back to you, Dr. Mebaudu. Um, could these um, insinuations of whether they harvested uh, um, Debola's um, organ, could it have been avoided if the mother was granted access to witness the surgical procedure? Is there, are there any laws that require that uh, a, a caregiver, I mean, someone who is the guardian or the mother or the parents, or who is representing the, the patient, should not be allowed to witness medical procedures? Let, let me tell you how the, the flu should have been to me. Probably they do it, probably they didn't do it. So, you know, first and foremost, this is a case referred from a private hospital. The, 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 um, the mother sits, the father sits, or the other person sits. Because you, you cannot just be one person. Your set of doctors also sit across on this table on a, in a counseling room. That's what you call the room, it's a counseling room. It's a space for that interaction. Yes, we've looked at your son. These are the conditions. These are the conditions. We are going to do this and this and this. We may see this and this and this. And then when we choose this and this, we have to do something like this. This is the aftercare once this thing happens. Right from the beginning, the mother is aware, or the people, the, the relatives are aware of the likelihood. Now, the second stage is that now, for you to see what we're doing, you put, we put on this thing. There's a place you can sit in the theater where you can watch what is going on. Translucent glass. Yes, you can even see what is going on. Please, Madam C, this is what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about. This one is not uh, uh, viable again because of the ischemic bowel problem. It's not viable again. You, if you put it inside this, if you leave it inside this, uh, this boy, it's going to die. It, it, there's nothing you can do. A dead tissue cannot stay with living tissue in human body. And a pulse cannot stay high anywhere in human body. You have to you know, evacuate it. So the mother understands that this is where I am. Okay? Now, when you finish the procedure, yes, we have done this. The tissues that you harvested from the, you take from the procedure, you cut away, you resect it, you bring it out. Madam, this is the tissue. Can we hand it over to you? Because sometimes we, we tend to overact. Or do we dispose it? Do we hand it over to you? And that is what most of us used to do to the placenta because of the cultural, uh, cultural uh, perception mm. of what is possible. This is your placenta. Take it, go and dispose it the way you want to. I understand some, I, yeah. I read something somewhere that some people eat the placenta. I don't know what that, that, is that, that, that You know there are a lot of mental cases now. Don't <laughs> just leave those, that, those people alone. Right. So you know, then you show them what, you, what was taken away from the boy's body. This is it exactly. What do we do? Okay. Ah, please help me dispose it. I don't want to see it. Okay. You, you, help, you, help, me document that. you help her document that. Right. And then you now go back the second day. Your boy is in this situation. This is what we need to do. This is what we need to do. This is what we need to do. Do you have any question? Okay? That patient caregiver engagement is becoming so pivotal in healthcare now. We must not run away from it. And those things must be documented. And these are the things that they put into the healthcare practice or you know, clinical practice in other places. Not really abroad per se, even in other places that I really want to look at the flow of their health system. Right. So now, for me, I'm telling those medical people to actually consider that. Those thorough documentation. It, it can be an issue if you don't document properly right. in healthcare. Like what we are yes, experiencing. What we're experiencing now. So then another issue is that the media, okay? Media is about now it's about clicks, likes, you know, trending. And anything that could make them trend. They will go so for it and push it. On, right? Medical reporting is not just like every other reporting. They have to do some deeper training. I am sure if they had come to Dr. Abbasi and said, that, listen, we saw this kind of thing. Can you enlighten me? 
We should have actually put them down. Okay, so we'll, we'll put that at the tail end of our conversation. Yes. You know, what, what the, the role the media is meant to, you know, play in reporting accurately, representing the medical industry, I mean, the medical sector, in order to help the people consume the right information rather than sentiment. But then, before we get there, um, I heard of a story, people who are reacting to this Debola issue, saying that when she was met to undergo a surgical procedure, there was a tattered man who was in the hospital. She mentioned the name of, no, I think she didn't mention the name of the hospital, but there was a tattered man, a, a man who was not neatly dressed with a doctor. And they were having a conversation with the doctor, and she didn't know what was going on. And she was um, maybe, what did they give them? Is it sedation? Or sedation just to make them, yes. yeah, exactly. And she, she fell asleep. She didn't know what happened, but she was, she was praying. By the time she woke up, what the medical procedure was meant to have done, maybe they were able to do it or not, but she got the feedback from the nurse that um, she's got a lot of fat, so she may, they may not be able to get okay. to some of her. So she felt that there was an underhand, a shady dealing that was meant to have gone on. What does this say about who should be in the theater? Who should witness what? And how can people trust the system and the process? So we're, we're talking about layers and layers of issues, which necessitated my suggestion that we need to go back and look on the foundation of which our healthcare system is. Because it's okay to say you want to invite, even with child delivery, you invite the husband, the prospective father and everything. Some of the family members do not have the stomach to withstand the operating room. And so, but in this case, this is an underage, Debola is an underage boy. His mom, his parents are there to give signature the least of which the medical community could have done is not to be anti-transparency. Like my colleague said, just be open. Your own documentation is for you. It's, that's how you transfer knowledge. Because if I'm being on call 24 hours, if I'm going to transfer my patient care to you, you need to read my documentation to know what has actually transpired. In this case of what you're bringing is that your surgical suite, your theaters should be controlled. It should not be the environment where you even have people in plain clothes because that can easily lead to contamination and all these things we're talking about. So there should have been restriction, but that's not the job of the Lagos State House of Assembly. That's the job of the Nigerian medical community where there must be protocol. There is policy and procedures everywhere else abroad. When we talk about US, we talk about Canada. They were not built overnight. And unfortunately fortunately for us, some of these facilities were established by Nigerian trained doctors. So it's not that we don't have the brain cells. So there's got to be something environmentally here and a condition of practice that is leading to all this lousy, I still feel strongly, is a case of medical incompetence and the case that you alluded to. So if somebody that is not meant to be in the theater, to the extent that if my family member is being under anesthesia, they can, somebody else can even overhear. That's a violation of medical privacy. It shouldn't be. So in a lot of ways, yes, the governor has stepped in to be able to help this little boy that there is more that needs to be done. Mm. And a lot of it should fall on the medical community. The government can step in with the power of enforcement, power to provide the needed instruments, the needed infrastructure. Because again, this day and age, why would somebody deliver a baby and there will be no phototherapy? When you know that jaundice could be a complication. We're not talking about that now because yes, yeah, she's not a Lagosian, but she's a Nigerian. The case of Adebola is one out of many. We have to understand that. What is going on with our medical curriculum? To the extent that we don't even, nurses cannot report doctors. I'm yet to see a nurse that will come out and act as a whistleblower. Because this case we're talking about, the doctor did not operate in isolation. The doctor just did not come up and operate and then sew the boy back. There were other surgical associates. There were assistants. There were nurses for the aftercare. Why are they not talking? Let me quickly jump in with this. Uh, you know, we know that the, the, there are three parts of small intestine, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum, you know, yes. just like you say. So now they say that a part of his duodenum is still missing, just like you've also alluded to. And um, it, sorry, it's still present, but the ileum and the jejunum is missing. Is there any complication that could make, you know, this thing disappear? I feel strongly that was from the ruptured appendix. This is where the appendix is. This is where the ileum is. The ileum is like, just like the beginning of your large intestine, which is the colon, quote unquote, a body. Mm -hmm. So if the appendix had ruptured, that means it had actually got inflamed. It had had pus, like all this infection collected there. So how many days, how long did it take the mother, the father, to bring the boy to a medical attention? So could he have presented with some symptoms, some signs and symptoms, which maybe if they have reported to the hospital earlier on, they would have mitigated the effect or 
you know, address the issue quickly. Absolutely, all of the above. So they came in because of delay to present to medical care, which is so common with Nigeria, because we need to point the blame where it is. We don't have a lot of educated consumers. So they present late, whether it's for family, cultural reason, or even lack of finances. But now, what about the first medical person that saw the boy? What was the documentation? How transparent was it to say, look, what I'm seeing now is a medical urgency, is a medical emergency. I'm going to take out the appendix. Yes, there could be complications because it's already ruptured. And if you look at the medical literature, ruptured appendix has a significant amount that will lead to bowel obstruction. Bowel obstruction will cut off the blood supply to the intestine. That intestine is dead. And leaving the, a dead intestine in the boy is actually more of a medical malpractice. So they did what they needed to do. But why are they not talking? Why are they covering up? There has to be transparency. Mm. And there has indeed, to be indeed, punishment. Indeed, indeed, this, is, this is where I want you to come in. Down. Yes, okay. You know, we've heard about stories of... Um, medical negligence, which both of you have you know, spoken you know, heavily on, uh, where surgery, surgical procedure must have been carried out, and they say they forget, or the doctor forgot uh, needles, forgot um, some, you know, some sharp objects, and, which normally shouldn't happen. I just feel probably this is a myth, but you know better. Uh, we, 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 we cases where this we happens. beyond that. <laughs> well, cases <laughs> where this, that cases where this <laughs> happens, uh, are there punishments? Are there legal procedures? Oh. Are there ways of, you know, Seven punitive measures on, 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 on so-called Of course. You see, practices. you know, doctor, doctor pro, uh, medical practice is self-regulatory practice, I can tell you. Because you go through a lot of processes. Let me, let me, let me even start with this case of this uh, young boy now, Debola. In the theater, you might have up to seven, eight, ten people in the theater. So where would there no, be? business there. It, you, no, 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 not business. Working. Okay. Anesthesia is there. The assistant is there. Scrub nurse is there, assistant nurse is there, the doctor is there, the main surgeon, the assistant is there. A lot of people are there performing different roles. Where would there be now that say, okay, you know what, let's cut and go and address this, yeah, go and sell this thing? It's not good to happen. You see, doctors that I know, the little I know of them is that they pride, it's a lot of suffering to get that certificate. It's a lot of suffering. They won't trade it for any stupid thing. And okay, well, let's leave that aside. Now, medicine is a self-regulatory care because in, in your training, you are trained on critical aspects, deep thinking, okay, assemblage of unlikely symptoms, then working cooperatively with people because that's why, you know, because, and then ability to interact with human beings. That's why you do a lot of oral exams and all those things. Now, there are rounds. Rounds are layers of people, okay, from the house officer to the Consultant and the big, big consultant, they all of them follow around. What have we, have we done? Discussions, options, look at books, what have we done the incident? What do they do in this part of the world about this kind of thing? That is, then secondly, after even that round, there's what they call a grand round, where everybody will sit down, your unit will present, that one will present, that one will present. You will be self critiqued. And then you see some, even officers, you know, having to lose promotion. You see officers having to be demoted. You see officers having to have their um, they, they are, they are, like Charles of Star, their time extended, That's right. you know, and reprimanded. I, I can tell you, except it has changed. You understand? But again, there's a point where, you know, we can actually be a sort of discouragement to enthusiastic medical practice, you know, by negative press reportage. By, you know, by dwelling on that negativity, by saying that, by not even having to understand the whole spectrum. Yes, of course. There, there must be a lot of compromise, some compromise somewhere so for you, we to get to this on, point. You're big on medical reportage. Yeah, um, on media. I'm are you saying to, that you know why? There, there must have been bad representation of what had happened. Yeah, yeah, you know what? You're not bad representation. You know, there's a disinformation. There's misinformation. Yeah. There's weaponization of information. We have to be careful with this. I was, you know, you know me now. I was here during the COVID. I was virtually every time talking about COVID. Why we should do. So it got to a point where the information was weaponized and used to attack everything possible. The church weaponized it. In this situation, don't let us weaponize information, you know, to whip, to attack, to denigrate. Do you understand? We can only do that when we have the complete spectrum of understanding of what it means to do health reporting. Okay? If I say that somebody lost Bowell, you know, and somebody is calling to have thing, they're two different things. If somebody has necrotizing enterocolitis, ischemic bowel problem, 
and you have to reset. It's a different thing from harvesting. Yeah. So again, and those are the tiny words people play with. Yeah. And then they run with it. You know, they used to say all sorts of things without understanding the depth That's of what right. happened. That's right. So, so, and of course, when it comes to actually, you know, being open, there's a limit to what you can say in, in about patience. There's a limit. Yeah. I cannot just come and say that, you know, you see that person and you she was HIV positive, the husband changed that away, this and that. There's a limit, yeah, you know, pri privacy, because you sign to that. Fiduciary aspect of medical information is key, and you have to really gauge it. What do you say, what do you don't you say? That's right. Before it becomes another, another uh, litigation. That makes issue. a lot of sense. So it's very important for those that are, you know, listening to both of you experts, you know, talking about this issue, uh, to know that at what point should they present themselves, or should they, yeah, present themselves for medical checkup if they are seeing certain symptoms. You know, you were saying that Nigerians are not always very quick to report issues to the, to the hospital. Um, a lot of us are, you know, <laughs> we, 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 are corp we are then, uh, we are corporates. <laughs> so yeah. Guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. I was looking for the right word. So uh, at what point should Nigerians go to the hospital, regardless of whether you have money or you don't have money, and the role of the you know, government in this. So, so, so to answer your question, the only reference I have is where I have been practicing for only God knows how many decades now. Nigerian healthcare delivery system, quote unquote, it's a three-legged stool. We have the primary healthcare, the secondary healthcare, and the tertiary. In the United States, we have the primary healthcare where you and I can present to our primary doctor's office. Monday through Friday, some doctor's offices open on weekends to attend to a little headache, running stomach, you know, temperature. And then we have the urgent care. The goal of primary and urgent care is to reduce the number of people that will end up in the emergency room. Mm. Nigeria does not have that situation. We don't have that urgent care. But, but, but the, the symptoms of um, um, appendix yes. comes and it goes sometimes. Yes. Um, when it comes and it goes, when it goes, does it feel like it's no longer there? Or some people will feel like, oh, it has gone. I don't feel the pain again. So appendicitis is considered a surgical emergency because of the, what we are talking about. You don't want it to get to a ruptured stage. Appendicitis, itis means it's inflamed. Yeah, inflamed. If it's inflamed, even just driving and getting on a bump is going to make you have what is called peritoneal pain. Your abdomen and you are ready to throw up. Is a 13-year-old boy. That's where you think, who are his caregivers? That's where someone... But then they may have been handicapped because they may not even have a primary care doctor. Mm -hmm. Their PHC may not be functional. We have 30,000 PHC in Nigeria. Only 20% are functional. So they may not have access to that. Hence, Amazing. they end up in a private hospital where finances could be an issue. But don't let's just talk about the gloomy thing. What are the solutions we're likely to have? So that's yeah, where... Okay, I thought you were going to say something okay. about the solutions. Yeah, about the solutions. In less than a minute. Exactly. About the solutions, that's where we're talking about the medical intelligence. Medical intelligence will give us data-driven. That's where we're going to know what are the infrastructures right. we have and we don't have, right. and what are the things we need to do. How many doctors do we have? How many have Jackpot? Yeah. And what does the government need to do? Right. Our government should not be bogged down with this. Absolutely. Lots, lots and lots of questions you know, requiring answers, and I believe that and those who are watch, watching us will definitely take a cue from you know, some of these mistakes that would have happened on the aspect of the patients and also the medical you know, caregiver. Thank you very kindly. Uh, public health consultant, Tui Mebaondu, uh, thank you so much for your keenness of insight, as well My as pleasure, medical always. consultant, Chief Medical Director, Heritage Men's Clinic, Dr. Rashid Abbasi. Thank it's you. always uh, a delight to have both of you on, on the thank show. You very thank you very much. And thank you to you for watching. Let's tell you that the views and reactions of all our resource persons are theirs and have no connection with CBC News.